So we're sitting down here at the Grand Prix of Lommel and uh, found myself in the in the living area at the GP of Lommel and uh, got Adam Wheeler from On Track Off Road and next to me is the man who I actually haven't met until today or, or yesterday evening. It's uh, Chris Liat from uh, the founder of the, the Liat Neck Brace and it's pretty exciting to be here and, and to be talking about some, some really cool subjects about the brace, how the, the company was founded, why the brace was actually first built. So I think we should start off with a small introduction and, and just see see what you think and, and tell us exactly how the brace was you know came about. Well, thanks for the introduction and taking the time out of your training schedule to uh, to have a chat. That's really good. Um, and Adam, you know, always good to see you. So. You know, the brace started for me um, many years ago after witnessing an accident uh, that really sort of changed my perception of, uh, of uh, safety protection and I think quite pertinent for me and you'll understand that you know having a young child, uh, my son was four at the time, just started riding um, two weeks before this event um, and, um, and I went to an enduro event and somebody had fallen off, broken his neck and, and passed away unfortunately. And my young son Matthew, of four years, was with me, and it really struck home that I needed to protect him if I was going to let him continue to ride. Um, and that's what I did. I stopped him riding, and I sat down and, and really thought long and hard about uh, whether there was a way to uh, prevent neck injuries. So, with science and a sort of a surgical approach, coming from a medical background to to why injuries occur, I came up with this idea and this concept. Um, had to build it on family members initially, um, lots of prototyping. And, um, and then had to also find a way to test it because of course there were no test standards all the dummies that were in existence were mostly for car accident, uh, accident reconstruction um, and uh, eventually we got to a point where we had a, a prototype that was actually wearable um, and some physical testing that gave us some good results uh, and uh, after being invited to Germany by BMW and using their you know, much more advanced test center it allowed us to, with confidence, move forward with the, with the project. And uh, I remember saying to my professor, I want to take a year out uh, to go and pursue this and find somebody to make it. And well, you know, it's 15 years or 16 years ago now. Uh, so haven't been back to medicine since. All right. So it's sort of taken over my life. I mean, on that subject, Chris, I mean, like you say, it's been 15 years since you first started things. Is it still unusual, unusual, I mean, to see, to come to a world championship event or to talk to athletes in the US or, for, or globally and see how the neck brace, the neck brace is still being used and, and how people have responded to, to what you kind of dreamt up? Uh, I mean, I have to pinch myself every now and again. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's a significant product and a significant um, uh, part of my life and you know I, I when I travel to a foreign country and I see a van or a shawl uh, you know storefront uh, or somebody wearing uh, my name which <laughs> which is actually just a holding pattern the, the company wasn't you know in the beginning it wasn't really going to be a company it was about solving a problem and it wasn't going to be called yet it was a holding pattern name and it kind of stuck because it's an unusual an unusual name um, but it's actually fantastic to see it uh, still out there you know, in the back of my mind when I started, if, if I thought to myself, if, if, the, if, the, if the science is right, it actually does prevent injuries and uh, it's comfortable to wear, uh, there's no reason why, you know, it couldn't have worldwide appeal, but you know, that's sort of in the back of your mind. So it's, it's fantastic to see where it's come from and it's also allowed us to approach other problems, you know, uh, from, from hair protection to knee protection. Uh, it's uh, allowed us to take the same kind of scientific approach and hopefully we we'll continue to see products in the market. Because I think there's people that still think, do I need a neck brace? Does it work? But for sure, I mean, you've used it more than 10 years. So, I mean, why did you pick it up in the beginning and, and why do you still wear it? I think for me in the, in the beginning, you know, right back to 2007, when I think the brace was finally just starting to take off after the initial initial sort of testing and you know your first prototype, you managed to get it sort of out on the market in around 2007. That's when uh, braces became available in Europe, and you know there was very few guys using them. I remember Tom Church from Molson Kawasaki, and it was actually the team that I was riding in at that point. And the team manager said, "Look, I bought you one of these neck braces. You know, I really think you should be wearing it. You know, take away and take it away and try it." And uh, it was after the first race uh, of the season, you know, I just said, okay, let's, let's put this thing on, see how it feels. 
and you know we, you touched on it yesterday evening about you know males when they buy something they don't necessarily always look at the instructions straight away and um, you know it was one of those cases as well I took out the box put it on and I went and done a moto and straight away I didn't feel that comfortable with it so I came back looked at the instructions set it up properly and from that moment on there was a click where I was like I didn't even really feel like I was wearing it and it, it, it just didn't you know sort of annoy me at all when I was riding so from that moment on I just you know began to use the net brace every single week and uh, you know just seen how the, the brace developed over the years and you know we're, we're at a point now where I've got a brace that I, you know it's lighter than before it's easier to clean it's, it's easier to set up for, for loads of different guys you know in, in a matter of just two or three seconds you can sort of set up the front and set up the rear um, and you know I, I just I just don't know that I'm wearing it and I just think that if there's something out there that can really protect you then what why aren't you wearing it you know I wouldn't think of riding without a helmet I certainly wouldn't think about riding without my knee braces because that's you know a feel thing but you know my knees touch wood have, have never given me any problems but the brace is the same for me now you know until I finish my motocross career there, there's no chance that you'll catch me on a bike without without a neck brace. I mean it's kind of like an iPhone you know it seems every edition has been lighter or as a some modification it's you know there's been some sort of improvement I mean if you look back to images of you in 2010 the brace looked like quite a cumbersome piece of kit I mean yeah. Chris in Chunky, terms of yeah. making that evolution has that has that been a major major investment has it been like I don't know millions of dollars or millions of hours or it's it um, it requires a lot of time so if we from the old brace to the new brace to the next generation brace what's really important for us is that it performs the same way so we have a, a sort of an interesting um, lab setup where we take uh, our brace and we we, we drop weights on an, on an anvil and try and um, understand at what point the brace will fail because the failure of the brace at a certain force is important um, and then we try a lot of different materials so there's obviously a lot of R&D into what materials to use then you, then you decide that I'm going to use glass full nylon for example instead of uh, composite um, and then becomes a manufacturing problem you know how do you mold it and how do you demold it um, and then there's the evolution of materials so you know what is the, the feel of the helmet on the brace the feel of the brace on the body um, so there's a lot of uh, the, there's a lot of investment into molds there's a lot of investment uh, time wise and uh, you know you see the evolution from one product to the next but there may be 20 iterations in between to get it from the one place to the next it must be quite a feat of engineering. I mean, like you say, I, I don't think people really appreciate the, the R&D that goes into it. Um, and again, you know, how you've expanded that to the rest of the, the product range in here. But, I mean, just to tackle a couple of the, the subjects, I think people now, because the neck brace has been part of the motocross landscape for a good good while. Um, you know, you, still, you see riders like Sean, Marvin Muskan, people who have, like, confided in it for a number of years. But I think people still have questions. You know, they still think, you know, is this going to snap my collarbone if I fall off? Um, you know, is this going to be flapping around hitting my helmet when I don't want it to? Um, I mean, Sean, your experience, even with collarbone breaks, I mean, have you ever felt that you know is is endangered that part of your body or? No, absolutely not. And you know, the the newest evolution of the brace that I'm wearing, the collarbone cutout is absolutely, you know, there's no chance that that's going to be getting anywhere close to, to touching your collarbone. Um, you know, we, we actually covered, you know, on a chat, you know, yesterday evening that, you know, most of the time when you crash on, on track, you're going to put your hand out in front of you. The, the force is, you know, travel straight up your arm, through your collarbone, and, and, you know, that's the weakest point. It's made like that to actually break. So, you know, there's nothing to say that the, the brace touching down on it, you know, I think Chris would probably cover this better than myself, but, you know, there's, there's a theory that the helmet touching, touching your collarbone can actually break it down the way rather than breaking it up the way. So, you know, these are, all, these are all things that I've done in the past, you know, pre-neck brace for me, you know, I, I broke at least four or five collarbones, you know, and, and quite close, con, you know, concession. And um, after, after actually starting to wear the neck brace, you know, it wasn't until we actually touched on this subject earlier that, you know, I, I haven't broken a collarbone since I've been wearing a neck brace. And that's, that's really quite an amazing, you know, thing for me to hear because you know, there is a lot of stigma out there about people saying, ah, oh, I stopped wearing the brace because I broke my collarbone, you know, or this or that. But, you know, just, I don't think it's, it's, it's possible. Mm. Well, your personal experience, I mean, you know, you've, you've had four or five breaks before a brace and, yeah. and none thereafter. I mean, it's a, it's a really interesting uh, topic is that actually, and now um, the clinical data is out there, 
you are less likely to break your collarbone wearing a neck brace and there's a very good reason for that but you know all the way through the development of the brace we we, uh, we have a hybrid 3 dummy with uh, a special neck that's a motorcycle neck so the, the dummies that we use for testing are come out of the automotive industry uh, used for, for impact testing in cars so we've got a slightly modified version it's got ribs it's got a collarbone and it's got a, a motorcycle neck it's called an M MATD neck there are only a handful of them around in the world and they, they are more bifidelic and allow you to put the dummy in a, in a motorcycle riding position prior to an impact so as we've done this development um, and we measure the, the collarbone forces, they've, they've never been higher and, and in uh, impacts and in certain impact scenarios they're actually, they're actually lower. And we've seen from the EMS Action Sports study now that uh, there's a 45% reduction in collarbone injuries wearing a neck brace, which surprises us. It's higher than we thought, but we always thought that it would be reduced given a, given a neck brace. Um, as you mentioned, uh, falling on an outstretched arm, falling on your shoulder is going to break your collarbone. The other cause of a collarbone injury is your helmet rim. So if I fall on my left hand shoulder, my helmet is going to go to the right. So if I break my right collarbone and I'm falling on my left shoulder, it's likely to be from the helmet rim. If it's on the same side as my fall, it's likely to be from the fall. And that's going to be the vast majority, 80-odd 80, 80 percent of the falls are going to be shoulder or outstretched on the same side. But wearing a neck brace, you're now shielding the collarbone from the helmet rim and you're going to remove those, uh, those injuries and therefore there's, a, there's actually a reduction. So, you know, commonly spoken about this, this, uh, the fact that neck braces break collarbones. Why? Because collarbones are the most commonly broken body in, in motocross. Is it still frustrating for you that people make that link between the brace and broken collarbones? In the same way, Sean, that it's frustrating for you that they say braces impede your flexibility of the bike because you don't win Grand Prix in, you know, in tracks like Lommel if you have something that's impeding your riding. <laughs> Absolutely, you know, we spoke about this again yesterday, that you, the brace is there to protect you. You know, if, if you were riding and you didn't feel your helmet touching the brace at specific points when you were riding, you know, whether that's once a lap or once every other lap, then the brace is probably not doing its correct job. You know, it, you know your, head's, your head's all over the shop when you're riding, so some people can maybe say, oh, I can feel it touching the brace, you know, it's impeding my riding. It's not, it's just it's there to do its job when it's, when it's needed. And I think, you know, that's probably a, a small topic that we can touch on. Some of the MC5 guys were really revving up there. The, you know, the, the brace is, is made to, you know, to, to spread load during an impact. And I think, you know, there's a lot of stigma about the thoracic on the back. You know, that's changed in evolution as well. And I, I don't know if you maybe you want to just touch on some of the, the sort of... I mean, to answer both your, both your questions, I mean, it, 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 it does irk me a little bit. Um, not because uh, I don't like being challenged, I love being challenged and uh, I welcome people asking questions. The problem is that people don't ask questions. They, they, um, they, they come up with a theory, whether it's hearsay or uh, the trainers told them something or you know, there's, uh, there's a whole debate going on in social media. Um, you know, have an opinion, but have an informed opinion. Uh, I mean, I think that's really critical. Uh, if you believe something, you should have a, a basis for belief, not just hearsay, because you're not applying your mind. Um, so that's what you know, sort of is irksome to me. Um, but in terms of back injuries, and uh, I'd also like to touch on head injuries. But back injuries, T six T seven, which is round about where the thoracic member ends on the brace, happens to be the most commonly injured part of the thoracic spine. Commonly injured when you land on your head with a bit of flexion uh, in the motorcycle impacts. Extension is normally when the motorcycle hits you in the back. But a fall off a motorcycle that breaks your, your thoracic spine is normally mid thoracic spine, and that's where the, the strut ends. So it's coincidental that the, the two are around the same level. The strut, however, will break at a seventh of the force required to break the spine. So there's no ways that the strut has got any impact on uh, in extension back injuries. Um, and we've tested this, and it's been independently reviewed, and we've we've, uh, we've been sued in the in the U.S. Americans do like a lawsuit um, and uh, gone through full jury trial and uh, and all the expert witnesses could not prove that the thoracic member has got anything to do with with back injuries so um, it's, it's good to be vindicated there and uh, when it comes to to back injuries as I said they're normally in flexion when they're in flexion actually as the as the spine flexes the thoracic member comes off the back it's not touching the back in fact the pressure applied during a flexion injury becomes less with the thoracic member. 
Um, one other, one other topic which is often not uh, discussed or, or well documented is that uh, head injuries are actually less likely with a neck brace. So that may be quite difficult to get your head around initially. Uh, but if you consider that if you fall off a, a motorcycle land on your head, your, there's an initially a big deceleration head onto the ground and then your head starts moving relative to your torso. And if you watch high speed video footage of, of a head going back in an extension, it, you know, you can actually imprint the back of your helmet on your, on your back. It's, it's quite significant. That means very high speed footage that occurs for, for a very short duration. So you, you're not, you don't see it on, a, on normal video footage, but on high speed footage, it, it's hugely significant how far the head can go backwards. So now you have this head that's stopped and it now starts accelerating relative to the rest of your body and then stops again. So you have this big peak of, peak of uh, deceleration that your brain is exposed to and then you have a second peak as the head whip stops at some point. If therefore you can stop the head whip in the cycle much earlier, it doesn't accelerate as far and that second peak is less. So the, the insult that the head sees in an impact is reduced wearing a neck brace. So you think the message is, you know, the neck brace, you know, has kind of a multi, as a versatile use, you know, in terms of giving you a safety ad. But there's also the educational aspects of riders needing to fit it properly. Like you mentioned there, your anecdote, short of like riding and feeling uncomfortable until you adjusted it. So, you know, it, as simple as it is now, it's not something you take straight out of the box and throw on. You have to actually take some due diligence and making sure it's just working. Properly. That's the same with any any sort of technical equipment. You, know, you don't buy a set of 45 boots if you're a 43. And same with a knee brace. You know, there's all different sorts of sorts of different foam pads and things and different sizes, small, medium, large. Like a helmet. You know, you don't buy a small if you if you need a medium. So, I mean, yeah, taking the knee brace is a perfect example. You know, if you've got the lockout set at the inappropriate angle for you, you're going to climb on the bike and say, "Gosh, I can't ride." Yeah. Uh, might you know, it's locked. It's locked in flexion, and I can't yeah. ride. Um, it just you know needs to be adjusted, and um, and you know if your riding style changes, maybe you need to adjust your brace slightly. Like you start wearing a chest protector or a loose guard that you haven't worn before, maybe you need to do another little adjustment. Do you think you know from the fans that you've met, you know through your career in the last ten years or so, just like the customers and some of the riders you're speaking to, do you think? Uh, people are becoming more informed, they're becoming a little bit more educated now. I mean, like, Leia has a fantastic helmet as well with 360 turbine technology. I mean, the, the development in the helmet industry for off-road particularly is, is advancing. There's lots of theories out there and lots of kind of different technology. Do you think riders are getting a bit more smarter about what they need and what is out there and what they could buy? I mean, Leia itself has a, a range of braces. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there is a there, there is more awareness, and I think um, you know maybe our approach in the beginning wasn't the right one. Where we we published this white paper, and I think as I, as I mentioned yesterday, I felt it really important to put all our test data and all our research, um, make it available to to the public right right uh, in the beginning. But you know, if you want to read 141 pages of technical uh, jargon, it may not be the right uh, method. You know, we, we as as guys as we discussed battle to read the instruction manual so so you know I think uh, you know more, more video more interactive having riders out there that are ambassadors for the product because they believe in it and understand all the the, the potential safety aspects as you mentioned it's not just for necks it's for necks collarbones and, and, and brains um, so I, I think there's an evolution and I think um, what, what it's also helping us is that we're not no longer just a neck brace company our knee braces are very innovative. They don't have a joint in the middle. If you look at the C-frame, it allows you to grip the bike better. Uh, we have helmets that have got turbine technology, and you know there's a move these days towards, uh, and it's, it's really is the correct thing, um, like MIPS and other companies have done to look at rotational acceleration to the head. We used to think in the old days, and all the old helmet standards were written around big uh, deceleration is what causes brain injury. Actually, it's not. It's, it's a smaller rotational acceleration that actually causes uh, diffuse axonal injury in a big accident which is uh, which is catastrophic or, or concussion from multiple impacts so we've developed uh, in, the, in our helmet technology a turbine that uh, caters for both so it, it stops the low you know relatively low speed impacts that riders are suffering on, on a motocross track for example as well as rotational injuries and as I think our products grow and our ambassadors grow and, um, and hopefully with more sort of social media uh, input, um, uh, hopefully the public will become more conscious. And I think, you know, uh, racing organizations like the FIM and other governing bodies are starting to do the right thing in terms of 
introducing more test standards for, for example, roost guards and chest protectors. Um, it, it, you know, the way they're scrutinizing scrutiny products, making sure that you've got the right helmets. The FIM are now working on a, um, a new standard for helmets. Um, that is really a good uh, standard. It really looks like you know they're doing the due diligence and their homework, and they're producing a really good standard for helmets. Uh, and I, th I, I think that the next step for the for the public and for the evolution of safety is that there's got to be a neck brace standard. Um, unfortunately, we as a company can't produce it. Um, you know, we can we can certainly assist in what we think is the right aspects to cover in a good standard. Um, but you know, if you look at the way standards are being developed and, and the FIM's approach to the new helmet standard, uh, I'm really hopeful that that is going to uh, accelerate the understanding of, of safety. At the end of the day, I mean, you you, you love riding; it, it's your profession. Uh, you know, you want to keep on riding. You know, if you get injured, it has a significant impact on your, you know, on, on your pocket and your and your fun and everything else. You know, and most people, let's face it, aren't professional riders. They've got to go to work on Monday morning. So you know, rather. Ride, have fun, uh, and be protected. Ride safe. I think that's one of the things my dad taught me when I was growing up. He said, "Make sure you protect yourself because you know it's it's a long career. If if you protect yourself well, you can get the most out of it. And if you don't, you know, then it's going to be a disaster." Can you, can you ever see a time? Because now, if you look at another sport like MotoGP, airbags are compulsory. I know Alpine Stars have been collecting data for a number of years, actually, for an off-road airbag. Um, I, can you see a time when neck braces could actually enter the rule book? I mean, do you think it's possible? I mean, I know the FM are quite uh, non-committal about it. Um, I think they need more independent research or, or whatever it is they believe. I mean, Sean, do you reckon it was something that, you know, would you like to see more kids? I mean, I know there's lots of riders in Loretta Lins, uh, which is just happening in the US, um, who adopt neck braces. Kids are, seem to be, you know, really taking on the message to, of what this protection can do. I think with kids, you know, it's their, their parents are the main driving force behind which products they use. The kids don't go out and buy their own products. So, you know, I know from a lot of my friends and family, you know, they're like, oh, we need to make sure our kids protected. You know, great helmet, you know, boots, knee braces, Liat brace or some form of neck brace. And I think that's that's important as a kid. If you get used to that as a kid, you're more likely to wear it when you grow up. The, the, the main tricky market is the guys who have been riding for years and you know trying to get them to start wearing one. But I, I honestly think fitted properly, you know, a, a brace doesn't really inhibit your riding at all. So, you know, I think there, there should be more people wearing them. You know, I definitely you know tell people that they should be wearing a brace. And you know, I think in the future, you know, it, it might be a good idea to have it compulsory purely because. You know, at world championship level, you know, the, the, the speeds are getting higher every year, the bikes are getting faster, the suspension's getting better, the jumps are getting bigger. You know, it's, it's only a matter of time before the crashes become bigger as well. And, and I think, you know, I don't know, for whatever reason, you know, the last few years in MXGP, we have had a lot of injuries. Now, you know, if we can save some of those injuries by protecting ourselves properly, and I think it can't be a bad thing. Can you ever think of, can you remember a time where you've wrecked the brace or you've had a big crash and you thought, oh, that's, that's done a job for me? Or? Uh, it's just not very good to say, but yeah, I have, I have crashed a few braces. And, you know, when you come back in and you see, you know, the thoracic's done its job or, you know, you think, wow, you know, that could have been disastrous, you know, and I've walked away from that. I've came in, you know, I'm a little bit stiff, but at the end of the day, you think, you know, it could have been a lot worse. And, you know, and now I've got a wife and a young, a young man to look after. You know, that's very important to me. Because that's one of the, the ironic things is if you take a Leah brace out of the box, it seems so robust and well made. But the thing is, it snaps. It's designed to it's break. Designed to break it, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, it's designed to break before before um, it injures other body parts. I mean, you know, the way the brace works is to unload a lot of force that would have gone through your neck onto the brace. So, um, as we discussed yesterday, if you know, if, if uh, the threshold for injury. You know, the, the point with all the studies have said that if you drop somebody on the head and there's compression of 5,000 newtons, you are likely to have a neck injury. Um, and you wear a brace and uh, a 6,000 newton impact uh, is reduced to 4,000 given the brace. You know, you're walking, a, you, you've now walked away from, a, from, a, from an accident where you would have had an injury. Um, and um, I, I, I can't see how, given the, uh, the clinical evidence now, I mean, you know, the EMS sport, MS Action Sports study looked at almost 10 years and almost 10,000 riders. Um, 
is showing an 89% reduction in neck injuries with a brace. I mean, I think there are independent scientific studies, there are clinical studies. It's very difficult to ignore, and I think the first step really is to produce a standard. Um, you know, like there are helmet standards, you know, there really should be a standard for neck braces against which they can be judged, because then you're saying, you know, and it and allows racing organizations as well to say, you know, we're not just recommending everything, we're recommending something that complies with a well thought out standard. Uh, and the, you know, the collection of data that uh, Alpine Stars has been doing, the AMA been collecting uh, injury data, we've been collecting injury data, EMS uh, in, in the US have been collecting in injury data. The data is there and it doesn't lie. I mean, it's, it's clear that neck braces are good. So hopefully there's a standard in the near future. I think you're going to need to put your one on soon. Uh, yeah, it's getting near that time. Probably uh, going to gear up for first practice. And uh, no, just thanks, thanks to you guys for yeah. taking the time out. Nice to, nice to finally meet you after all those years. And uh, no, it's been nice to sit around and, and sort of chat around what the brace does for you. And uh, hopefully you, know, you guys can enjoy it and uh, you know give us your feedback. And hopefully we can. Uh, increase the amount of people wearing necklaces. Awesome.